In this lecture, we're looking at the later Reformed Church down in the Swiss regions and its rise to become a dominant Reformed Protestant movement for the remainder of the 16th century and beyond. And we can begin by reminding ourselves as to what has happened so far in the story. As the Lutheran Reformation got going, it began to more or less isolate itself from the Reformed movement down in Switzerland. A lot of this had to do with Luther and Zwingli fighting it out at the Colloquy of Marburg, the two coming to no conclusion on a partnership based in large part on a number of differences in their theology. The two sides had come together with a hope, at least, of having, if anything, a loose political partnership that would allow either side to remain defended against the onslaught of Catholic armies should they rise up to come after the Protestant regions. And the role of Zwingli in the Reformed faith and his eventual death really forms the backdrop to the struggles within the Reformed faith to come to a consensus. Those down in Switzerland were divided across a number of different lines. One of the more important ones that's underappreciated is the political and linguistic challenges of the fact that all the way up in the eastern part of Switzerland, you have a predominantly German-speaking populace. People like Zwingli and Bullinger, teaching up in Zurich, often gravitated towards an engagement with Luther and the German Lutheran movement. Well, down in the western part, down around Lake Geneva, you have a rise of French-speaking wing of the Reformed movement that shouldn't be overplayed, but you should at least realize that the differences between the German side and the French side of Switzerland during this day meant that the differences between these two sides, culturally at least, as well as their different histories and their different origins, meant that the early Reformed faith had to come together and find a place where they all could agree. After the Colloquy of Marburg, when Luther and Zwingli do not come together, what happens is Zwingli dies. A Catholic army comes to retake Zurich. Zwingli is out on the battlefield, and he is cut down, and so is Loss, the first major voice and the first major figure within the Reformed movement. Going forward, what will happen in the Reformed Axis is the Zwingli line there in Zurich, held principally by Bullinger, will increasingly become opposed or concerned about any relationship with the Lutheran movement. Others, though, who are Reformed, people like Calvin and Butzer and others, will attempt to live somewhere in the middle. They will reach out to Wittenberg, to Luther for a while, and after his death, to Melanchthon. They will attempt to draw them back towards their side. In fact, Calvin, for as much as he's known as a bit of a prig, as a bit of a snob, was really the last person within the first generation of the Reformation to still be reaching out to Wittenberg in an effort to bring the two sides back together. Zurich, though, is having really none of it. They are burned and hurt, you might say, collectively, at the way Luther treated Zwingli, and how, at Zwingli's death, that Luther even snidely said, thus go the way of all heretics. After Zwingli's death, though, you have Calvin arrive on the scene. Calvin had been a French humanist, living in Paris predominantly throughout his life, studying law, which should not be seen as somehow being antithetical to theology itself. The humanist study of law in this day was yet another avenue that people approached the classics and the period of antiquity. But Calvin was not a scholastic trained man as Luther had been. Calvin is really the younger brother throughout the entirety of the Reformation. He converts sometime around 1533 or 1534, Sometime in that range or so, he doesn't quite give us a date. He had been increasingly biblical and biblicist in his hermeneutics, and eventually, due to the persecutions under Francis I, when evangelicals were being tortured and martyred for the faith, which we'll look at more explicitly in our lecture on the Huguenots and the French Reformed movement, this drives Calvin out of France. And so, around 1534, he flees attempting to head down to Strasbourg, where he hoped to work with people like Butzer and a number of other eminent writers within the Protestant world. He took a detour, though. He landed in Geneva to spend the night. And it was there that Farrell, an acquaintance of Calvin's through his cousin, actually berated Calvin at one point, asking him to stay in Geneva to help reform it. Calvin had said that he's not much of a churchman and he's not a political man and he's not a reformer, 
At which point, Pharaoh browbeat him, yelled at him, and told him that he was abandoning the cause of God. This was in 1536. And a lot of what Pharaoh wants is a young man who is energetic. The 1536 Institutes, the very first edition of what would become Calvin's magnum opus, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, had been published. And a number of people found them to be very good, a good synopsis of the Christian faith. The first edition was just one volume, not the two-volume massive tome that we see today in its English translation. Well, Calvin relents, and he stays in the city. And it's important to know really a bit of Calvin's personality here. Calvin, to the day he died, is not so much hot-blooded and angry. Rather, he's more of a snob. He's almost always smarter than everyone else in the room. He had had a wildly successful and deep, rich education as a humanist in Paris. He had been set up to be a professor or a lecturer of some kind before he fled. His first actual publication was a commentary on a book by Seneca, an uh, ancient and important Stoic philosopher from the Roman world. Calvin, though, can be influenced. And for a couple of years, they're working with Farrell in the city of Geneva. Calvin really learns a valuable lesson about patience and collaboration. You see, because Farrell was a hothead all the way till the end of his life. He was impetuous. He kind of flew by the seat of his pants. And if at times, if his will was set on doing something, he was not about to listen to reason. The case in point is, at the end of Farrell's life, he, quite an elderly man, decided that he had fallen in love with a 16-year-old girl and the two were going to be married. Calvin and others tell him that he is a fool, that this will signal to the Catholic world that Protestants are merely excited old men who simply left the church for their own lusts. But Farrell went ahead and married her anyway. That is a bit of a microcosm of Farrell's personality. He would just as soon scream people down and shut them up if he felt that he was in the right. The problem, though, is the city of Geneva was not in a good way. Geneva had always been part of the Swiss regions geographically, but it answered to the Duke of Savoy, down a bit south there in the southern part of France. It was kind of a city in between both the Swiss Germanic regions and the Catholic southern French regions. Well, it had just only recently declared its independence, and it had been annexed, that is to say forcefully taken, by the city of Bern, which was Protestant. And so in Geneva, you have a populace that is used to the Catholic faith. It has not been widespread clamor for Protestantism. But now that it is overseen and controlled by the city of Bern, the Bernese want French-speaking Protestants to lead a reformation there. They are shorthanded themselves, so when Calvin arrives, he meets up with Farrell, who had already been conscripted by the Bernese, to effect a reformation and to encourage it there in the city. The city leaders of Geneva more or less wanted to go towards the Protestant direction, if only at times for the sake of protection. There were, of course, committed Protestants there within the city. Just like any city in the Reformation, it is torn along religious lines. Well, for two straight years, Calvin and Farrell, and really it's principally Farrell driving Calvin to be more hard-edged, just pummel people. They get into fights, they make stands. In one case, they submit demands to the city council for a reformation within the city. The problem, though, is the city, the city council, had no right to enforce a number of these reforms that Calvin and Farrell were putting forward. The city answered to the city council of Bern. And it's always been a head-scratcher why Calvin and Farrell pushed this issue when they're supposed to be there answering for the city of Bern anyway, affecting the Reformation. Instead, what they do is they stir up the hornet's nest. A number of the things that they call for are the abolition of certain traditional practices, and they want the church really to be clergy-led. This is one of Calvin's great fights all throughout his life. He wants the pastors to be in charge of the church. So, for example, with excommunication, if someone needs to be censured or under discipline. Well, it is traditional in these areas, in these cities, it always had been, that the city council, run by laymen of all things, had final say. City councils didn't like pastors controlling everything. And now that they had come helter-skelter into the Reformation, they were not about to let these outsiders, these Frenchmen, 
come into the city and start telling them what they can do without having some checks and balances. In the end, the city essentially says no, and they tell them to go back to work and to stop telling the city council what to do. At which point, Calvin and Farrell make a final stand at communion. Well, on Easter Sunday, they decide to not give communion to anyone there who had not agreed to or bowed the knee to their calls for reform in their specific outlines as to what they wanted, which effectively meant that everyone there except for Farrell and Calvin and a couple of other pastors are excommunicated. They hold back from giving anyone communion. At one point, they even bar the pulpit so that no one can get into it and speak against this decision by them. This is a hostile takeover, you might say, of the city of Geneva and its church. Not surprisingly, Calvin and Farrell are given just a couple of days to leave the city or else. Believe it or not, at this point in 1538, Calvin, now a failed pastor, and by the way, let that be a lesson to any of you who are training for pastoral ministry or who are pastors yourselves. Anyone can fail at ministry. Anyone can have troubles, particularly when you're young and dumb and impetuous like Calvin and Farrell are here. But the point is, is Calvin very well could have been a nobody who failed and was forgotten for the rest of history. He had come from the outside, and in just two years, he had nearly, with Farrell, ruined the city of Geneva forever for the Reformation. There was now talk afoot in Geneva of returning to the Duchy of Savoy, of returning to Catholicism, even if that might mean that the Bernese military force might come after them. Now, in the end, they do not. And, in the end, it's Bootser. Martin Bootser, who steps in and mentors and recovers Calvin for the Reformation. A number of the folks, again, all throughout the Swiss regions, really had no idea what to make of Calvin. They had read his 1536 Institutes and liked it. They found it very careful and calm and well-written. But no one had really met the man. And he was really young. He was just about 30 years of age at this point. But his track record, his resume at this point, was pretty poor, let's say. Well, it's at this point that Bootser steps in, and he and Bullinger conspire, as well as a number of others, to separate Farrell from Calvin. Everyone at this point essentially blames Farrell for the problem. They actually push Farrell to go take a pastorate up in Neuchâtel, which is a city that's French-speaking as well, that had embraced the Reformation when Farrell had called for it there. And so Farrell goes there, and he and Calvin remain friends on a number of levels, but the separation of the two of them actually gives Calvin, you might say, room to breathe. Not only that, but Calvin is called to the city of Strasbourg, where Bootser himself lives. You really can't make too much of the relationship between Bootser and Calvin at this point. From 1538 to 1541, Calvin lives there in Strasbourg, not just interacting with Bootser, but the two of them actually share a garden in the old European traditional sense. They live in separate houses, but they have a shared plot of land between them. Calvin talks in his letters about how he learned humility and theology and learned how to be a real pastor and a real churchman, you might say, at Bootser's table. Not only that, but he learned the family life. Mrs. Bootser was a phenomenally winsome and friendly person. And Calvin, as the young bachelor sitting there, his tail between his legs after his failures in Geneva, was on the mend in the Bootser household. One last masterstroke by Bootser is they get Calvin married. Calvin was enormously infirmed by all kinds of problems. We can't really go into all of them, but one of the things you have to remember when you look at some of Calvin's personality quirks and traits is the guy was just sickly. The reports we have, for example, of the number of parasites would give you the impression that the man is simply infested with disease. Not infrequently, he gets taken down by migraines and all kinds of problems. Calvin seems to have avoided marriage for some time, not out of a lack of desire for it, but in many ways, he simply wanted to work, and he didn't want to chase money, power, or fame through marriage, and he worried that marrying a humble woman would put too much of a burden or a strain upon her to take care of him, given all of his infirmities and his problems. A couple of marriages are proposed to Calvin. One is actually ideal, the daughter of a wealthy family there. And it's to Calvin's credit. He says, I don't need the money, and I'm a little turned off by the power politics of marrying me off to one of these 
important families? And he says, no. In the end, Calvin marries, you might say, for love. There was a young woman by the name of Idolette who had moved to Strasbourg after the death of her husband. They had actually been Anabaptist. They had been part of the more extreme fringe movement, which we'll look at in a later lecture. And Anabaptism at this point was more or less synonymous with radical, militant, apocalyptic views of the end of the world. And no one, frankly, trusted the Anabaptists, particularly not after 1536, when there had been an uprising in northwestern Germany that had caused hundreds and hundreds of deaths and thereby tarnished the name of Anabaptism for the remainder of the 16th century. Idolette had been Anabaptist, but through the work of Butzer and Calvin and other preachers, they had been won to a more moderate, sort of centrist position on the Reformation. But she was always known as the Anabaptist widow. And it's, again, telling of Calvin's personality. He did fall in love with her. She was his companion for life. He doesn't give as much of the soap opera story that Luther and Katie von Bora give us from their letters and their interactions. And people have been prone to see Calvin and Idolette as sort of a sexless, cold marriage. But that's not the case. They were both sick. She was a widow. She brought children with her into the marriage. But Calvin married her knowing that tongues would wag that he had married an Anabaptist, that his character would be called into question by people that wanted to pluck some of the courage from him for being a Protestant reformer. And he was going to be slandered by all kinds of people for doing this. But he decided to do it anyway, and they shared a number of years together, despite all the problems and the infirmities that Calvin went through until her death a number of years before his. By the end of Calvin's stay in Strasbourg, he is a recovered man. He's learned patience, a lesson he frankly will have to relearn repeatedly throughout his life. And he has become a married man. He is now significantly more established and ready to go back to some city at some point to be a reformer. In 1541, though, Geneva asks for Calvin back, or rather it is proposed and Geneva accepts. What happened was a cardinal by the name of Sadoletto, who himself was a humanist and was really more of a centrist person. He wasn't hard line against the reformers themselves. He wrote a letter to the city of Geneva, essentially asking them if they had buyer's remorse for having joined the Reformation. He laid out a case for them to return to the church. He doesn't slander them, but he says, look, we all know there are problems, but the way to fix those problems is to come back to the church and be received. It was then asked around the Swiss regions who might be ideal to write a response to this. And again, Bootser puts Calvin forward. He gives him a shot. He says, go for it. I need you to write this for us. Calvin does. He spends a number of weeks and months working on it. And the book is published today in English as the reply to Sadoletto. And Calvin doesn't go point by point through Sadoletto's letter and critique him or slander him. Rather, Calvin rewrites and weaves into a larger defense the entire rationale as to why anyone would be Protestant. It's by and large considered one of Calvin's most influential and well-written works from his time as a reformer. The Institutes, of course, are always cited as the high end, as a lengthy analysis of his theology. But for a man who's a humanist, there is nothing like a reply to Sadoletto to show him at his best form responding with conviction, and yet making a pretty airtight case as to why they felt the Reformation needed to be external to the church and no longer internal to it. Well, in 1541, Calvin is actually restored as pastor to the city of Geneva. Geneva sends an entourage up to escort him down, and in actually one of the more touching moments in the Reformation period, when Calvin returns, he asks very explicitly that there be no red carpet, no fanfare, no mea culpas from the city to try to make him feel welcome now that they had invited him back just a few years later. And when he mounted the pulpit the next time, the story we are told is that he flipped to the passage after the last sermon that he preached, and metaphorically speaking, he doesn't make a big deal of this, he seems to say, where was I? And he continues on with the sermon series through the biblical book that he had been preaching through. For the remainder of his life, Calvin lived in Geneva. He was always, 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 though, under the thumb of his enemies, or at least at friction with them. Calvin is hardly the tyrant that he is often remembered as being in the city of Geneva. He has no ultimate power in the sense of being able to tell everyone what to do. By and large, it's the city council always 
that is running the show. And they can censure Calvin. They can put parameters around him. There can be all kinds of reasons why they don't let Calvin's wishes be the only thing determining their steps there in the city. And so it's from the context of Geneva, after having been booted out once, after being restored and mentored by Bootser, that Calvin becomes a landmark reformer for the Reformed faith. However, as we go into the later Reformed period, as the century wears on, what happens is, is there has to be a collaboration between Reformed voices throughout the Swiss regions and even beyond. As we've said on a few occasions, and as we're going to continue to say throughout this first section of this course, it is anachronistic, at least historically, to refer to the Reformed faith as Calvinism. Now, I slip in and out of using that word, mostly because we're used to it. But from this context that I've given you right now, it should be pretty clear that Calvin is not the only man determining the Reformation there in the Swiss regions. Bootser and Bulliger, frankly, are the big dogs on the block. They have embraced Calvin, and they see his talent, and they love the fact that he's French-speaking, and he's down there in the Genevan area. The real moment, though, when you have a coming together of the Reformed movement happens in 1549. In a matter of speaking, if there's any moment where there is now, we could say, a united Reformed voice, it's in this year. Bootser and Bulliger never quite got along. Their relationship was increasingly frosty. A lot of this is due to the fact that Bootser had been converted to the Protestant faith by Luther himself. During the Heidelberg Disputation, Bootser was a monk, and he was there in the audience, and he describes it as mesmerizing. As a result, until the day that he died, Bootser was always a man to reach out to the Protestant Lutheran side, even though he himself did not agree on every point. Bullinger, of course, being a disciple and the successor to Zwingli, wanted nothing to do with that. And so the two really, again, push further and further away. Bootser would eventually go to spend the last of his years up in England at the University of Cambridge, having been called up there by Cranmer to become one of the major professors of the theology that they were attempting to instill during the rule of King Edward. Peter Martyr, by the way, another Reformed figure, is also installed at this time at the University of Oxford. Just goes to show the collaboration between the Reformed world in general and the early Anglican world was pretty significant. But Bootser kept moving around and Bullinger kept worrying that there in the Swiss regions there needed to be consensus between he and others within the Reformed world. And again, here in 1549, Bullinger and Calvin, Zurich and Geneva come together and they create a document that today is called the Consensus Tigurinus. Now, the Consensus Tigurinus in Latin just simply means the decision or the consensus of Zurich. If you can believe it, Tigurinus is the Latin name for the city of Zurich. Zurich is the German name. Well, at this point, Calvin and Bullinger come together, and the Consensus Tigurinus is a declaration about how they agree on the doctrine of the sacraments. Now, this is important. This is just 20 years after Zwingli and Luther failed to come to a conclusion at the Marburg Colloquy. But the two sides here do come together, and they agree. The document itself is a marvel of collaboration and give and take. Calvin's view of the sacraments, of course, were closer to Bootser, which is he didn't want to talk about how Christ wasn't present in the sacrament, even though he disagreed with Luther on the physical eating side of the equation. Calvin instead wanted to talk about the spirits present in the sacrament. Bullinger had more of the Zwinglian edge to him, being concerned that talking about spiritual presence was possibly a backdoor to saying something close to physical eating. In some ways, the Zurich line is more intensely opposed to talk of presence in the Eucharist in general, though they do believe that Christ is always present by his spirit. And so, in 1549, at the Consensus Tigurinus, the Consensus of Zurich, Calvin and Bullinger come together and make a consensus that really ushers in the Reformed faith, not identical in doctrine, but rather collaborating on a common core of convictions. And this is important to know, again, about the Reformed faith. I often say, I always say, that they are a band of brothers. This is why we don't call it Calvinism, because Calvin is not the only determining voice, either in the 16th century or beyond. He's one of the major voices, of course. And in the English-speaking world, 
the word Calvinism often is synonymous with Reformed, and so we just sometimes get used to that. But from an historical perspective, Calvin is not the only person. He's the younger brother. But in this case, he is also not unanimous with other people in the Reformed tradition on the sacraments. What they agree to is a common core. Now, what does this mean for the later Reformed tradition as it carries on? Well, it means a number of different things, but the most important things to note as we look down the quarter of time in the development of the Reformed voice is that it is promiscuous, I always say. Reformed theology coming out of the Swiss regions always has a pretty united perspective on the majority of things. Their differences tend to be different shadings of doctrines as opposed to radically different doctrines on certain key areas. Different cultures, different languages, different leaders shaping the voice and the grammar of the Reformed expression in different cities. This reality in just the Swiss region is carried on all throughout Europe wherever there is Reformed influence. And for the remainder of the history down until today, it continues to be this way. There are a number of different expressions of Reformed commitments in different cities throughout Europe. Take John Knox and the Scottish Reformation. John Knox and those who reform Scotland and create a Presbyterian form of church government love Calvin and they love the Reformed faith. In fact, if there's anybody in the history of the Reformed movement in the first two generations who really wants Calvin to be the lone voice, the single voice that they follow, it's Knox. Knox tends to back Geneva. He spent time there when he was in exile during the reign of Mary I. But Knox and Scotland are not the only voice, and they're not the only place where Reformed theology takes root. There are French Huguenots, as we call them, and as we'll look at in a later lecture. They are equally Reformed, and they live in the country of France. There is the Dutch Reformed movement that will give us later the Synod of Dort, which is often said, wrongly, to be the five points of Calvinism, which more accurately should be described as the five answers to Arminianism. There's also a not insignificant number of people in England, and even in Germany, in areas that are not dominated by Lutheranism, that begin to really listen to the Reformed perspective on things. Each of these different contexts will have slightly different shadings, and over time will develop either somewhat different cultures or even largely different cultures based on the context in which they are created. Just compare, for example, Scottish Reformed Presbyterianism with the Dutch Reformed Church. Are they the same? Well, in a manner of speaking, sure. They're Reformed. They're, quote, Calvinistic. They read and cite and base their theology off of the insights of their forerunners in the 16th century. But are they the same? Another answer could be no. They're different cultures, different church governments, different structures. They have different fights. The Presbyterian world, for example, in Scotland, never had to deal with Arminianism. And so you don't have as robust of answer or a concern, you might say, of widespread Arminianism within their midst. A lot of their fights hinge on the issue of the English crown and the independence of Scotland and its church from Anglicanism and the English church. You can do this repeatedly throughout all the different pockets of places where there are reformed voices or a reformed ethos, you might say, in different parts of Europe. So what this means is you cannot see the reformed faith as a monolithic set of doctrines that boils down to five points or ten points or whatever else you want to say that it might be. But it's rather a core set of convictions shaped by people like Bullinger, Butzer, Calvin, Peter Martyr, Zwingli, and others that carries on all throughout Europe and then all the way over into the New World. Thank you.